Mm-hmm. Hello everyone, I'm Lana. I work at the West Orange Public Library. I'm doing collection development and uh, book discussions. First of all, I wanted to thank uh, everyone who came today, who is joining us today for supporting the library. We are very happy to bring you this uh, virtual author visits um, while we remain closed. Um, this month we will have two more author visits and we're hoping you're gonna join us. Um, to be able to see what we offer, you can just go to our website and look at the calendar or um, you can check our Facebook as well. Um, I also would like to mention that we're going to record this uh, presentation and uh, it's going to be available on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. And now it's my sincere pleasure to introduce Eileen Harrison Sanchez and her book Freedom Lessons. It was published in 2019, in November 2019, right? Right. Okay. And uh, it can be more timely. Um, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll just give you a, a little brief explanation of my background. I am an educator. I uh, This book is based on my experience as a young teacher when I was 22. It was my second year of teaching. Uh, I am now retired from teaching. I retired after 40 years. Um, and I, through that, I was a classroom teacher. Then I became an evaluator for students with disabilities. And then I eventually I retired as a school administrator in, uh, in public schools. So I've gone the, the ramp, rampant of, uh, of that kind of, of educational program. I did not intend to become an author. I love to read. I love historical fiction. I like to write. And so then I started to uh, write this book as actually as a, as a memoir. And before I start, I, I really feel like I have to, um, to say that you know, I wrote this book to share some personal events that happened 50 years ago. And the events of today are so similar, which is uh, frightening, upsetting, worrisome. Um, in 1967, 1968, there were a lot of demonstrations and protests and riots and a great deal of uh, a similar uh, public dismay as we're having today. Um, so, but I felt when I wrote the book, I wrote it because I believe that our stories, when we read historical fiction, it humanizes history. It, it brings us closer to what it was like for the people in that time. And I, I want to um, just to recognize that we need the stories we need to know the stories of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the thousands of people that have died from COVID-19 in the past months. We're in such a unique time um, and it's just so important. We need to listen to each other, we need to talk, and we must do better because it was my hope that I never as much as I'm glad to be here speaking about my book, I, I didn't want to be repeating the past, and we are. So we need to change that. I have a quote from Nelson Mandela before I start to talk about my book. He says, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. If they can learn to hate, they can learn to be taught love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. So I've always felt that um, that's what my, my freedom lessons are based on. And we can talk about that a little in a little while. Um, that we, you know, we, we need to do better. So anyway, that's 
pretty much who I am and the beginning of what I, about my book. So um, the book is, uh, takes place in 1969, 1970 school year. It's in the midst of mandated school integration in the South. Uh, as a result of the laws from 1954, 19, the Brown versus Board of Ed, then we have uh, 1964, the Civil Rights Law, and then a little known uh, civil rights uh, decision from 1968 called um, Alexander v. Holmes which was, the decision was made on October 28th, 1969, and that was the, the final straw for the schools to integrate or they would lose federal funds. From 1964, they had five years to move forward. Uh, many of the southern states in different districts used what they called freedom of choice as a way to um, start to move forward. Some districts did integrate. It wasn't totally across the board that they did not integrate in the South. It was, there was more integration uh, in, the, in the North and states and probably the Western states. Not that it was all smooth, but um, it was quite a, a, a culture change for me to come from New Jersey in 1969 to go to the Deep South and to teach in the school. So that's how my story is, it evolves through that. So I do have a presentation that Lana's gonna put up a, a little slideshow that I'll talk about because it has some pictures that um, people are seem that, that we can share a discussion about it. So you can go to the first slide, Lana. Uh, you mean next one? The next one, yeah. Oh. Okay, so I started to, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about um, how I started to write this. Um, school desegregation is something that we all learn in history class and maybe you've seen these images of uh, of Ruby Bridges being escorted to and from school by the US Marshals. That was in 1960. But for most of us since in 2020, that's a near extent that we understand about that tumultuous time. But my first memory of the inequity in public schools struck fear in my 10 year old heart. So if you're good in math, you can figure out how old I am. Um, in 1957, the image that I recall of the nine African-American students being escorted by soldiers into Little Rock High School. And it was the photo probably on the front cover of Life magazine or one of those um, magazines that was a photo of a white girl, a classmate of these uh, nine African-American students. And her face was contorted in disgust. She was, her mouth was exploding with words of hate. And that image remains in my mind. And at the time, I, she reminded me of a neighbor of mine. She had a uh, nice page boy hair, which is styled hair that I envied. And uh, I, I thought, would my neighbor come and start screaming at me that way? What could I do if she did? And um, but presumably not, because I was a 10-year-old white girl living in New Jersey. I was not a black teenager in Arkansas. However, only 12 years later, when I was 22, I was living in a small rural town in Louisiana, and for the first time in my life, I did experience what it was like to be judged by the color of my skin, by my name, and who I agreed to teach. So my name had changed. Uh, my last name, my maiden name is Harrison. My married name is Sanchez. I married a Cuban man. Uh, and at the time, that was looked upon with caution in certain circles. So um, 
you can move to, we'll talk about the freedom lessons later, but I just wanted you to get a sense of what, what they are there. Can you move to the next slide? So um, imagine this. On a November afternoon, remember I said October 28th, 1969 was the, the decision from uh, Alexander V. Holmes' decision. And on November afternoon, a young teacher walks into her classroom with her second grade students and four men in dark suits, white shirts and narrow ties, that's how they dressed in those days. They didn't have their fedoras on. It was, it was the South, they didn't wear hats as much there. And one of the men is an African-American uh, and he was the principal of the school. The other men were white and they were very stern, unsmiling. They had clipboards and pens in their hand and the principal said to the teacher, just go ahead about your teaching. And uh, she did, she tried. The students were kind of reluctant to participate. They didn't want to talk, they didn't want to read. Everybody was nervous, the teacher was nervous, but she figured, well, this is the way they do observations in this district. She had never been there before. Um, but they stayed about 15 minutes. They left with a nod from the principal, and then the teacher and the class got back to the regular lesson and things were seemed better. But at the end of that day, the teacher was called down to uh, the cafeteria to a large room with those men uh, and the rest of the teaching staff and the custodial staff and anyone else that worked in the school. And they were informed that as of tomorrow, you will report to the white school across town. So it was a Tuesday afternoon, they closed the school. The next morning, everybody has to go to the white school. And um, that was it. There wasn't a whole lot of information. That teacher was me. And this school year is the 50th anniversary of what some call the crossover uh, in 1969. So that's when the, the schools that had not integrated yet integrated very quickly because by the end of that year, December, 1969, the uh, five years were up and they would lose federal funds. So you could go to the next slide. Uh, this was, this is a picture of my classroom from 50 years ago. It's not a very high quality photo. It's, it was taken with a, one of those little brownie cameras and it was just, you know, like a, four inch square photo that actually is enlarged to even fit on the way it is. Um, and those are the, the children. The wing of the school was uh, new. It was attached to the, it was a K-12 school. So it's attached to another building. And this wing had the first, first to fifth grades, I guess, uh, in, in that wing. and a typical classroom that you might think, oh, that looks good. But there weren't, the materials were very um, limited. Um, they were all second book, secondhand books. Uh, everything was um, used or repaired or broken or falling apart. Um, that's, the black school got this, everything that was second Hand, hand me downs. Um, the school was known as a training school. The high school level offered industrial and manual training for African American students. And you could go to the next slide. Now, this is a trailer, a portable building on the back lawn of the actual school that I'm did move to. It's not the trailer that I taught in, but we were moved from the white school, from that classroom that you just saw, I mean from the black school, into the white school, into a trailer that did not have windows. That's why I put these X's on. <laughs> there were no windows. There was a door. It had air conditioning, but it was very small. It's not like the portable classrooms that we have today. Um, 
it was a storage trailer that they put into use. They put four of them on the back lawn of the school and I was in one. I had the 24 students that I started with and I got an additional six students. So there were 30 kids in that trailer. And in order to fit everybody in it, we had to put um, four rows and each the side rows were uh, lined up on the wall. The middle two rows were bumped together and then that created a, uh, an aisle for the students to pass their, their uh, chairs through or to walk through to get to the back of the space to have a reading group or to do some kind of an activity. But it was very tight. Um, and that's, that was, the integration was me because I, we were in the white school, but we were not part of the school. Other classes were more part of the school. There were classes that were mixed. Um, the teachers that I taught with in the black school, uh, the, except for one or two that of my memory, the rest of them were second teachers in the classrooms in the white school and they were um, they did not have their own classrooms anymore they didn't lose their positions they didn't lose their pay I should say but they did lose their classrooms you can go to the next one Lana so it was a difficult year this is another picture of of the children another you know, it's not a good quality picture. It's an old picture I was glad to, a friend of mine found and, and gave me a copy of it. Um, it, was a, it was an unfamiliar culture, a small Southern town, unwritten rules. I was from New Jersey, Central Jersey. I grew up in a very uh, suburban, uh, actually all white town. And it was just a very, it was quite a different um, culture for me. Everyone struggled through the mandated integration, but I never forgot about the 30 students that at the end of that year, I was forced to keep them back in second grade. And to, and I didn't, that was not my decision. I was directed to do that. And I found out two weeks before the school year ended. So you could go to the next slide. People ask me, you know, why did I write this book? You know, whatever sparked my interest in, in writing a historical novel. Um, 10 years ago, I was at a professional education conference in New Orleans. And if you ever visit New Orleans, you must go to uh, Tim O'Brien's that's what they have these hurricanes uh, the drinks and the top picture it's hard to see it but there are two baby grand pianos and a big uh, mirror behind them so that's reflected in there so it looks like four pianos and so if you're in the audience these two pianos they're dueling pianos they play together they play off each other it's a great deal of fun so everyone is having a nice time. We're having drinks and we're at, you know, listening to the music and they will, you know, do requests and we're singing along. And in the middle of all that, I said that, well, I've been here before. I've taught in Louisiana and I, I told my story and um, people were very surprised that, that I did that, that I, that I had that experience because I, it was not something that I shared. Um, I explained that the way I wound up teaching just for the one year was my husband was in the army and we lived, he was, he was stationed there permanently for that year. It was the last year that he was serving and I went to live with him. So that's, that's where we were. And I was a teacher, so I went to teach in school. So when I started to tell this story to my friends and I realized the impact that it had on my personal life, um, it affected the rest of my teaching career. It affected the way I looked at the equality in education and 
overrepresentation of minority students in special education programs. Uh, it, it really, it, it was, it affected my, my life. But I also realized what a significant, significant event it was in the history of our country. And when I realized that I was a witness, I also felt a responsibility to share that experience. At the time, our first grandchild was two years old, and a friend of mine challenged me to write about it, that my, my granddaughter is biracial, and she felt that she needs to hear this story. So I started to write, I started to write a memoir. Could you switch to the next? So when I started to write, I realized that I only knew my story. I was very young. I was, you know, I had returned to New Jersey at the end of that school year. I, uh, my husband, when he was discharged, we came back, we were back with family again. And I, I realized that, um, the other thing, I, I never knew what happened to my students. So I just started to do a lot of research uh, and that led to the historical fiction. And if you could flip to the next slide. So one of the first things I learned was how important libraries are, not that I needed to learn that, but how important it was in Louisiana. Uh, this is Rosa Keller was a very important uh, reason. She was the, a very one of the women, uh, only white women, that really pushed for libraries in Louisiana to be integrated even before public schools. So in 1954, when the mandate came for um, integration in public institutions, uh, she made she really was in the forefront of making that happen in New Orleans. And part of the reason was that she was married to a Jewish man, and she saw the impact of prejudice through his eyes. She didn't know, she had never experienced in the same ways that I had never experienced anyone judging me for just for being me. It, um, so she was the reason that public school, uh, public libraries were integrated. And um, libraries continue to be part of my story, which I'll, I'll add in to this uh, talk in a bit. You could go to the next slide. Um, what I, d I did leave out a some one part I wanted to tell you. When I grew up in the town I grew up in, and I'm the eldest of five, uh, my siblings, when they went, th when they left first grade, they left with a library card. Their teachers, it was the practice of the school for the teachers to give the children a library card. So when I had these second graders, and in the beginning of the school year, and we needed materials, of course, I went to the library to get materials. And they didn't have library cards, and they didn't use the library. And it was a surprise to me, like, well, we have to go get some library cards for you. But in the book, if you read the book, you'll find out that that was not a simple task. Um, the libraries were integrated, but the practice of the black families actually being welcomed and using the libraries was really not the case. So it was, uh, I did get the children library cards, but it, it was a bit of a struggle. So this is a slide that talks about the research that I did. Um, when I started to do the research, librarians helped again. The first was the librarian in my town and another librarian in the town that I worked in. And they both just helped me to collect newspapers of the day, the New York Times, made, gave, helped me to get connections to Louisiana newspapers. And then my town librarian 
actually connected me with a, a librarian in New Orleans, and she gave me a whole list of, uh, of resources that I still have, the email she sent me, it's like three pages long, of all of these books that she thought would be useful for me, all in that time frame like 1968, 69, 70. And the most important one that I found was a dissertation that was titled, Even the Books Were Separate. And the man that wrote it, his name is Gary Clark, and he was a high school student that same year that I was a second year teacher. Uh, we have become friends. I got to know him. I've met him several times on my travels to Louisiana. But I used his, his dissertation was the type that has narratives from six individuals. And so I had some actual conversations and, uh, it, you know, really quotations, experiences of six different people that actually lived through the same year that I did. And it was the first time that it was affirmed for me what the experience was like. Uh, there were two other dissertations that gave me similar information, but his was the one that really connected with me. I did my own black history study, I guess. Um, I took some workshops in facing history, uh, choices in Little Rock, which is an important, uh, an important book. Uh, for high school students. And this is Warriors Don't Cry by Melba Beals. She was one of the Little Rock Nine. This is her memoir of that year. That was 1957. Um, I learned about sundown towns through this book. Nice, nice big fat book. Um, and I just did a whole lot of internet research on Jim Crow laws. The New Orleans funeral service history was an important piece of information. And I'll, I, I created some of the background for one of my characters that her father was a, owned a funeral home. It was an important uh, role that the black funeral home served their community because in the times much earlier, um, they were not, when someone died, an African-American died, they were not treated in, in the regular funeral homes. So they had to create their own. They would, some in the very beginning, they would lay them out in the barn. So that's uh, the beginning of the funeral home, the service uh, funeral homes history. So I learned about the integration of the libraries and, and black colleges. So all of that created background information for my characters. You can go to the next slide, Lana. So this is one of the characters I created. I told the story from three points of view. Um, one of the characters tells my story. And then I needed, I felt that I really needed to tell the story from a black teacher's point of view. And Evelyn Glover is the character's name. Uh, that is my friend who is Evelyn. Her name is Evelyn. I did name it, that character in her, in her honor. I created the character Evelyn in the book to support Colleen. Um, as, uh, and to also give background to the expertise that the black teachers did have. Uh, education is very important in the black community. Um, it was, they, they had high regard for it. They managed to educate uh, so many scientists and professional people in the history of when you look at the how they used what they had, it, it's quite amazing. And Evelyn was a third generation uh, educator. 
the character and my friend <laughs> is also. And I, so it, it helped me to tell the story from the black teacher's point of view. Um, so I also created her to kind of guide Colleen, who was a, a second year teacher. And I have a passage in here early on. Uh, Evelyn was, the character was uh, 10 years older, so an experienced teacher, and she was helping Colleen prepare some lessons. So I'm gonna read one passage out of the book. Uh, the scene is that uh, after school, Colleen is doing lesson plans and Evelyn comes in to talk to her. So Colleen picked up one of the readers and opened to the page with Dick and Jane scurrying to help their mother take the clothes off the line because it had started to rain. In it, a Negro family with twin sisters, Penny and Pam and their brother, Mike, were friends with Dick, Jane, and Sally. Evelyn, Colleen said, this is a really old book from 1956. Why don't we have the new edition? Evelyn's rare smile disappeared. We take what we get and this is what we get. Did you look at the inside page? All the books came from the white school. When they got books, when they got new books, we got new ones too. Colleen felt her eyes widen. Evelyn shook her head. Don't look so shocked. Some folks think we should be grateful that we have a Negro school at all, separate but equal. A friend of mine had to set up a new classroom in the white school last year, and she found out that they store the books in different stock rooms, colored in white. If they can't even mix the books, how do they think they can mix the students and the teachers? And that is an actual quote that came from the dissertation uh, that was titled, Even the Books Are Separate. So that's how, also how I brought the research that I did into the, into the story to be, make it credible and accurate. You can go to the next slide. So this is uh, tells you the story of the Frank, who is the student, and he tells the point of view, the story of that year from the point of view of the student. Now the way, at the point that I was at uh, writing the story, I hadn't considered writing in a in a young boy's voice or in a football player's voice. Uh, it was, I was thinking that I would tell the story maybe from the voice of a, of a girl, or maybe a middle school girl. But what happened was five years ago, I went back to the town to visit the, uh, to visit the town. I was able to actually get into the school to meet the principal of the, of the school at the time, um, when she found out why I was there, that I had taught there, and that I was interested in finding out about my second graders. I wanted to know whatever happened to those kids. At this point in time, um, they're probably in their mid-50s, and I just think, you know, to have been retained as a second grader for no reason, like it's always just bothered me that 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 happened. Um, she told me she didn't know anything about that because the town and her family was very, uh, the, what they were fighting for was that the high school seniors were not supposed to graduate. So they were going to keep the high school seniors back. And so the stories about her brother in 1969 and the football player role, what else I learned from the dissertations was when the, when the schools were integrated, it was one thing for uh, 30 second graders to be housed in a classroom with a teacher, but the high school students when they moved into the, they lost their leadership roles, they lost their positions on sports teams, they lost their prom, they lost their, their ability to graduate from their own school, that they had been at, in attendance from kindergarten. Um, and it made, I mean, in some ways you can understand that 
when they moved in November, those roles were taken by, they had leadership roles, the white students already had those cheerleader, every, the cheerleader teams were, the football teams were selected, the baseball teams, everything. But so those, the students lost a lot. And it just gave me so much information to find when I was reading uh, the, one of the other dissertations about it, focused in the same way, the narrative, six stories, it was talking about the students and the, the, the challenges that students had that I kind of just gave you a brief uh, summary of. So Frank in the story is a star football player and he's counting on a school scholarship, I mean a football scholarship to go to college. Um, and he, he wanted to make sure that he got to college. He was a good student. Um, he, he was working hard. They started, the students were having uh, demonstrations. They were not, they were having peaceful demonstrations. Uh, and that is also from, I got the information specifically from the dissertations, the kinds of, they were um, nonviolent demonstrations and they were following um, certain code of, so I want to read to you about Frank and what he decided to do when they had a demonstration that he was, his girlfriend wanted him to come and, and support, support it and he was not sure what he was going to do. So Frank stood up and walked to the window. He looked down at the lawn in the front of the building. From his third floor view, he could see the street and the circular drive around the flagpole. Black students stopped to take brown bags from their from parents who seemed to have known this was going to happen. And they were actually making deliveries. Laughter echoed up to him as the students sat on the grass and began to eat their lunch as if they were at a picnic, except for Deidre, that's his girlfriend. And she was also the student leader. She had been the head cheerleader and the student council president from the school um, before they moved over. He saw her stand to, to speak to the principal. He knew what her request was. He wondered what the answer would be. His heart was racing. He had made up his mind. He sat back down at his desk. More students were leaving their classrooms, shouting and slamming doors. As he sat in his chair, his teacher sat on the edge of her desk. She looked at him for a long time before she spoke. Frank, you were on the football team, weren't you? I heard you were a star player at West Hill. Yes, ma'am, I was. Well, don't you want to be heard too? Yes, ma'am, but I'm not going to miss class. I'm going to graduate. I'm going to college. Dr. Henson studied him. She ignored the white kids who were whispering and shaking their heads. Then she said, well, there's more than one way to succeed at something. All right, class, let's continue our discussion. You can go to the next slide. So Colleen, Colleen's story is my story. It's fictionalized to intersect with the stories of Frank and Evelyn, but the experience of that year impacted my entire professional career as I explained a bit before. But who I am at 22 isn't much different than who I am today. Perhaps I'm a bit wiser and not quite as idealistic, but I still expect that people believe in and follow the golden rule. This picture gives you a hint about what happened when Colleen was stopped by a police officer after she took four of her students to the library on a Saturday morning. I explained to earlier that that was her practice to once she got the students the library cards um, she had in order to get the cards she needed to get parent signatures and it took a lot to have that happen people were questioning her why was she doing this um, and then once they all had their library cards she took turns uh, taking four of them to the library on Saturday mornings so on the way back one Saturday this is what happened. Officer, 
did I do something wrong? Well, now, that depends. Why would a white woman be driving in these parts? I took some of my students to the library and then I drove them home. He palmed her cards and he walked to look at the front of the car. New Jersey, you're far from home. His tone challenged her. There's no library out here. Colleen felt her throat constrict. She needed air. Breathe. I took them to the library in Kettle Creek. Scrutinizing her identification, he rested his hand on his hip above his holster. She heard a creak as the leather strained across the pistol. No teacher of mine ever took me to the library. Are you collecting signatures or something? Signatures? What for? He handed Colleen her license and registration. Little lady, you're far from home and you don't belong down these roads. We've had some nonsense with some of the church ladies coming out this way with their northern people signing up the coloreds to vote. Don't come this way again, you hear? Or else you'll find this is a, this is a heap of trouble you know nothing about. So that really happened. <laughs> and I put it into the story. Um, do you have, do we have one more slide, Lana? I think. Okay, so um, I've written the story about one school year, 50 years ago, from three points of view. And besides my own experience and my black history research, my personal black history research, I took the advice of Ellen O, the CEO and co-founder of We Need Diverse Books, and Daniel Jose Older, an American fantasy and young adult fiction writer. I reviewed the 12 guidelines that Older has written for writers to ask yourself how you can respectfully write the other from the perspectives of others. And Ellen O encourages writers to create stories that reflect the diversity of the world we live in. Her advice to people who write about indigenous and people of color is to tell the story properly or be prepared for criticism. She asks, do you need to tell this story and do it right? And yes, it's my story too, and I did my best to get it right. I had my, my writing vetted from, by two black authors, um, by the historians that wrote the dissertations, and my editors and so now I have my I got my story published and I hope that people will read it and and think about what I call my freedom lessons uh, and I like I said when we when I started to talk like we really need to to listen we need to talk and in today's today's world people are perhaps they're starting to really see that they must talk but books will help us to do that library conversations will help us to do that so i'm very glad that i was able to talk with you and if you have i think that's all the slides right but I if you have there's one more there's one more yeah oh, oh. Yeah, I think there are two more. Okay. Well, so this is um, after I wrote the book. Uh, as I said, the this is the 50th anniversary of what in Louisiana is called the crossover. And both of these examples are about other school districts and what they did the same year. So the couple, the white woman and the black man, um, they were classmates. They were in third grade in 1969. And I got their story from storycorps.org. It's, uh, it, I can tell you more about it, but it's an excellent resource to just learn about other people. Um, but from their story is that in third grade, the black students moved into the white school 
And she was the top student in the class. And it didn't take long for her to realize that she had some competition from Eli. And she didn't, she wasn't too happy about that. Um, all through their school year, they, they were classmates, they were never friends, but they were always in competition with each other. At the end of, when they graduated in their high school yearbook, there's a picture of each of them, um, a black couple and then a white couple, uh, most likely to succeed. So she was the most likely to succeed from the girls, from the white students, and he was the most likely to succeed from the black students. Today, they both live in Alabama. She is a, a college instructor and administrator, uh, an educator, I, I'm, I believe I'm remembering that right, and he is an obstetrician. So they both, and they both live not too far from each other. Uh, when StoryCorps, I don't know how they found them exactly, but when they found them and brought them back together, they had never, hadn't seen each other since high school. And they, if you go to this, to the link of StoryCorps and find their story, they talk about how, what a shame that they hadn't gotten to know each other at that time, because, you know, they're, they just, they missed knowing each other and now they're both, so they're both successful. On the other picture is a picture of a current um, high school football team from this school year and back in the fall. And the name beneath where it says treat all with dignity, uh, coach Joe Nagata in 1969 was the football coach of that school. And when they integrated in that town, a small town uh, in one of what they call the Florida parishes of Louisiana, like uh, more east of New Orleans, closer to Florida, uh, there was, the coach is a Japanese man and he had uh, experienced discrimination during World War, after World, during and after World War II because he was Japanese and because of the, uh, the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor and all that. And he, he knew what it was like to be discriminated against, to feel prejudice. So he instructed his white football players to accept the black football players and integrate the team. And he said, he put them all on duty to make sure that, that the integration would go smoothly, or at least if there were some problems that, you know, they would intercede. So he was one man as, that helped that school have a smoother integration experience the same year that my story didn't go as smoothly. So it, it doesn't, it, sometimes it just takes one person. And I thought that these were two interesting stories to include in my background. So that's why I have them there. There's one more. No. Oh. Well, so I, I'm this, I'm so glad that I had a chance to talk with you today. Uh, I was very busy at the beginning of, from November. I was doing a lot of in-person talks. Uh, I did win a, a, a best book uh, finalist award. So that, that was nice, a nice recognition. Um, I, within the, uh, the time with meeting um, uh, Gary Clark in the dissertation writer, um, and we became friends. He recommended my book to a group in Shreveport, um, Louisiana, who was studying how to, what to do about the crossover, how to kind of acknowledge that 50 years ago this happened and, and try to take a, uh, a 
check on how are we doing, what can we do better, um, what worked, what didn't, those kinds of things. And so there were this, there was this group that was having these conversations. They selected my book to be required text for two of the uh, classes, uh, freshmen, 18 and 19 year old students in that college. And then I was invited to go to uh, speak to the students in their classes. And then I also did a public presentation uh, in Louisiana uh, back in February. So it was a very rewarding for me to go back and have that experience. And the students were, were very interested in, in the history and, and to see they could understand the, the feelings of the students that are also represented in my book. So it, it was a good conversation. And then, um, I was also selected as a, a Pulpwood Queens, an official book selection. So this, um, it's a book club that has hundreds of book clubs across the, the country. And uh, it's, it's an official selection recommended to the book club. So that was, those were my little, little perks of telling my story. So I guess maybe, do you have, anybody have some questions? Um, but just the, um, I think I have some questions. I was, gonna, I was gonna say, Lana, I always have a question, but I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, we hear you, go ahead. First, I wanna say, Thank you so much, Eileen. That was very interesting. Um, you. you know, as you mentioned, poignant during these times, but also for myself, um, I was born in 1970. Uh -huh. So I did not grow up around segregation or, or exposed to any of the aftermath. But my question, I mean, to you is, it's 2020. Um, what are we doing wrong? Hmm. What are we doing wrong? It's a heavy question. <laughs> heavy loaded question. <laughs> well, I can answer it in this way. Uh, in the, one of the freedom lessons, when I, when I, after I, wrote the book and the, your publicist or your publisher says, okay, if you're going to go out and you're going to have these book talks, like, what are your messages? What are your points? And it took me a while to, as I thought about it, and I came up with five lessons, five messages that those are my, really my talking points. So the one that I think answers your question is prejudice is taught and learned. That's what I learned through my experience, through my observations, and through my, um, you know, just my career and my life. Uh, and so, and it's not, you know, we can have these laws that, so you have the civil rights laws from 1954, 1964, 1968, whatever laws might come up. But laws don't change people's opinion. People change people's opinion. So I, it's really up to each of us to make, make a change. And you, just, you don't know what your everyday actions could lead to. And, and if, as long if you are open, and my other, one of my other messages is, uh, treat others as you would have want them to treat you. So if I'm following those rules for myself, then I'm, maybe somebody else will make a change. And I guess, Lana, this is a time I can tell that other story that you were asking about. Um, as I've gone to different presentations, uh, it depends. Sometimes there's just a few people like tonight and that's fine. Sometimes it's a 
large group like I was when I was in Louisiana and actually that was pretty overwhelming but you just don't know so I was at a I was invited to a small uh, to a women's group in a t in in a town that is actually to this day um, and not a s integrated town uh, it's still, as far as I know, an all-white town in New Jersey. I know this town well. I was invited to speak at a women's group. I asked my friend if she thought, was this really, you know, you know what my book's about. Are they going to be receptive to this book, to this story? They are um, of German ancestry. They, there are more than Germans that belong to this club now because my friend is Irish. So it's not that there. It's, you know, I'm not trying to say one thing or about the group, except that when I, she said, "Oh yes, they love history. Come." So I went and I gave my presentation, which was pretty much what I just said to you, and maybe I talked a little bit more to the people because I knew the town. I grew up in the town. So I felt like maybe there were people in the audience that I that might have gone to school with me or knew my family or whatever, but I wasn't making any connections. So I gave up. It got a warm welcome. I mean, a, a cool welcome, I should say. A cool, lukewarm welcome and a lukewarm presentation. At the end of the presentation, I had a giveaway where I had a basket with a book and some other things in it. And the woman that got it was thankful. And so the evening went on. I had some treats with my friends. We talked. At the end of the evening, the woman that when everyone was leaving, um, I got you know, some people were just nodding at me and it was, uh, she came over and said, she held up the book and she said, thank you for giving me this book. My father emigrated from South Africa when he was 18 and we moved to a town nearby that I knew the town. Well, he moved there and then eventually he had a family and she was one of his five kids. She said, we were never allowed to talk to black people. I never talked to a black person until I was 25 years old. And I'm going to take this book, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to make my grandchildren read it. They need to read it too. They need to know this story. And we need to make changes. So you never know what, if it's going to make a difference. But if we don't we each have to do what we can. And, and then of course you vote, you know, that's why we have elections. We vote for people that will, um, our representatives in government that will make the changes that we, we need to, um, that need to happen. But the changes to change someone's opinion about how they feel about another race or religion or a person's, um, nationality, that's harder. Laws can't do that. People do that. So that's a long answer. No, thank you. That makes a lot of, thank you. It no. makes sense. And you know, it's, I, I agree a hundred percent. It's the influence of our surroundings that, that don't, make the change happen faster, I guess. Well, I know, you think that I, that's the kind of the point of my book, it was 50 years ago. And in some ways, there have been a lot of changes. And other things, we have a lot to learn. We have a lot, we have to, we have more to do. So, any other questions? I just wanted to ask you a few questions on a, like, uh, on the topic of historical background because um, I personally, I didn't grow up in the U.S. and that I'm not that familiar with this history, so it's really fascinating for me. So 
was it unusual for black students to be retained this this that year or is it just rather an oddity that happened i found out later through my research that that happened a lot across the states that because the white schools had different standards or they felt that they the students didn't measure up and they did retain students it's not a good practice uh, the students that were if they were if they had remained in the black schools there there might have been a different process but the retention uh, across the board like that is never the answer so that was uh, that doesn't I think that happened that year. I've heard other stories. I read uh, a story uh, in a, a, from a Virginia town where a second a girl was still upset as an adult when she went back to uh, a high school reunion or a school reunion that she had been retained in second grade. Like kids don't get over that. It's a it's not a solution. So as a teacher and as, a, as an educator, that was something that I, if a student needed some help, then you need to figure out what, what is the reason that they're not doing well. It's not that they shouldn't receive the help, but uh, retention is rarely, the re rarely solves the problem because it creates new problems. Uh, do, do you have any information on how integration happened in other uh, towns across Louisiana, other states um, during that time? Are they more or less the same kind of um, situation or was it different? I, each in in louisiana they call them parishes so they would be counties in other like in new jersey it would be a county school um it it was done well in some places it depended on the planning process i mean if you in 1964 they were informed to integrate the schools so how did they you know, did they take the five years and plan it and and move forward? In some places, I think they did it grade by grade, or in other cases, they moved teachers across the schools. They and then students followed the following year. There were different models. Um, it was it was a challenge, and in later in life. Uh, in the years in the, let me see, in I guess the 70s was when there were all the busing happened. So there were still issues. I have a book here um, called Children of the Dream. And this author, Rucker Johnson, is a, a, a historian and an educator. And he, this is about the uh, Los Angeles schools and he and and beyond that but he feels that in his studies that the busing did work it did help but then there's other examples where busing was a was not helpful I mean when you have young children traveling on a bus for 40 minutes to get to a school or even longer and you know that's not always the the right answer but um, so this was 10 years after my experience when busing was put into place to, to continue to help the, the schools integrate. Did you ever, uh, were you successful at finding uh, any of your students? No. So. No. I, no. <laughs> It's it's kind of it was very frustrating that year when I was when I went back and the principal um, that was a black woman who was the principal of that school 
Um, and she was very helpful and she sent me to her sister, a cousin of hers that was in the, like the main office to see if they could help me find the records because I was looking for the class list. And she said, oh, I think they're in this other school. So then they sent me to this other school and the records were not found. So I couldn't even come up with a class list. I finally went to the school, to the public library again in town and I got some, they had a three ring binder that they finally found for me that did have some newspaper clippings and of the graduate, the seniors that graduated that year, both the white and the black students from that particular year. Um, but I've heard since then that many, there's so, when some other um, writers are looking for uh, information, there's another book that I have over on my table there, I won't get up, but it's called The Education of Horace Tate. And he, it, the author looking for that information, he had the wealth of information. He had records that in other, school districts, they just tossed them out that year. They didn't want any proof or what, I don't know what the reason was. When they moved everything, they just threw it away. Um, but the records were gone. So I, I never, was never able to find my class. And there was no school books at that time in that area? School books? I mean, the yearbooks, school yearbooks. Uh, they didn't, well, not for second grade, they didn't have them, but that's what I was looking for, the yearbook for the seniors. Oh, the seniors, right. And they, they didn't have it. They only had this three ring binder of. Okay. Yeah. I feel like it's a, it's a kind of book that can be used in uh, high school, not only in Louisiana, but here in New Jersey, I think it's something that can be recommended to teenagers. Um, I think um, it's a very interesting perspective how you're humanizing uh, people who live through that history and making them so you know uh real and everything so we'll definitely we can definitely recommend this book for our teens at yeah. our library and everywhere um how was it for you to launch this um to promote uh, the book these days. Uh, I know you launched it uh, in, um, in November of last year, but with the pandemic and everything, uh, did it stop or you just uh, doing virtual programs as well? Did it change anything for you in terms of? Yeah, it's changed a lot because I had, I had a lot of in-person events planned uh, a number of libraries uh, that I that I was invited to book book clubs mainly it, it it started in the beginning and you're introducing the book to readers and then book clubs were reading it I had some interest from uh, Barnes and Noble for to use it to for high schools to use the books but when the schools closed like everything kind of uh you know it yeah it, you can't you can't the schools are not there the teachers are not there they're so busy it really made a difference a change but i mean i thank you for inviting me to do this it's oh it's a pleasure it's, of course yeah uh, i have one question are you working on something else in another book or you're kind of done writing <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I have another. I have another idea of um, a similar topic uh, in the story. Uh, Miguel is Colleen's husband, and people wanted to know more about him and his story. And that's my husband's story from mm -hmm. immigrating from Cuba, and it's a very interesting story. So maybe that will be. That, that's 
I'm, I'm starting to play with that idea. All right. Uh, so I wanted to thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Very interesting uh, and very timely. And best of luck to you, whatever your plans are. And mm -hmm. uh, please stay safe, stay well, stay positive, everyone. And thank you again for joining in. And to you, um, Eileen, of course, for sharing your book with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, I have no voice. Thank you. Thank you very much.